page 58. Page 58.
guy that talked real proper. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so come to find out, he's famous too, man. I realized when I saw his portrait on the wall, uh, whoa, man. And uh, so anyway, he preached a sermon one time. I feel like he had two sermons that were really like vintage Southern Baptist sermons. In other words, sermons that a lot of people knew about, heard about, kind of famous stuff. And one of them is why I love the church. Why I love the church. And I'm not going to preach on that one tonight. The other one is called Who Killed Jesus? Who Killed Jesus? Now I love this message. I love this. Uh, I love the way he did this. And it's, you know, I, I just honor him and think about him and uh, honor the text tonight. So we're going to be in Matthew chapter 27. We'll start reading with verse 20. Matthew chapter 27. So we're going to start our Easter series. We're going to spend three or four weeks talking about the events that led up to the cross. And then we're going to spend that Monday, uh, uh, that Easter Monday, we're going to talk. Man, I just got a sermon out of deal for that. Wow. The next day. The next day, the world looked different, didn't it? Yeah. That's going to work out. I got a whole month to get that ready. Man. I got a whole month to get that ready. All right, well, let's stand together as we read God's Word tonight. Matthew chapter 27, beginning with verse 20. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Why? What then shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? By the way, that's the most important question that any of us will ever address. What are you going to do with Jesus? What are you going to do with Jesus in your life? They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that a torment or a riot was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people answered and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged or beaten Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, so much for your many blessings. God, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to meet together tonight, to study your word on a Monday night. God, we just thank you for that opportunity. Uh, we thank you, God, for Cowboy Church. And pray, God, that you just build a hedge protection around it and all that it's doing, around its programming and everything that's going on. We pray, God, that you bless our time together tonight. Bless our time of Bible study. Speak to us from your word. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 You guys can be seen. You guys can be seen. Well, I got a joke for you tonight. This joke is called the Silent Treatment. Did I ever give the silent treatment? Of course, I'm talking to you men. Yep. All right. A man and his wife were having some problems at home and were giving each other the silent treatment. Suddenly, the man realized the next day he would need, he would need his wife to wake him up at 5 o'clock for an early morning business flight. Not wanting to be the first to break the silence and lose, he wrote on a piece of paper, Please wake me up at 5 a.m. He left it where he knew she would find it. The next morning he woke up to discover it was 7 o'clock. He had missed his flight. He was furious. He was about to go see why his wife had not waken him. Then he noticed a piece of paper by the bed. The paper said, it's 5 o'clock. Wake up. <laughs> Men are not equipped for these kinds of contests. <laughs> oh, me. Oh, me. Well, our, our text is the first of several we will use tonight to investigate the question, who killed Jesus? Uh, it is so important to come to Easter every year and to experience what I call the gospel moment. And I, there's, there's nothing unique or creative about that. It's just that moment in life where you realize, hey, what Jesus did was more than something for the world. What he did was more than... You know, was more than die for humanity. When you recognize and realize Jesus died for me, this thing is personal. Jesus loves me, and He died for me. 
And He gave Himself for me that I might have forgiveness of sins and eternal life. I bet most of you probably can remember the first time that you experienced that. Where you was like, oh my word, He did it for me. Oh my goodness, this thing is personal. You know, I, I remember it like it was yesterday. I was seven years old, 1967. We had a tent revival. And, uh, and I'm telling you, man, having doors outside, having doors outside, having church outdoors, that's what that was meant to be. <laughs> having church outdoors is right down my alley even today. You know, I've wondered maybe sometimes, maybe we figure out how to have church in the arena. I don't know. You know, or a revival or something. I don't know. I'm just throwing that spitball in here. But I'm like, I love to have church outside. And we had a tent revival. And during that tent revival, we had sawdust on the floor. Now, my mama was a stickler. Miss Dottie knew my mom. She was tough. Now, my dad was a drill sergeant, and she was the tough one. And boy, I'm telling you right now, you didn't talk in church. You didn't move. You didn't do anything. To this day, I'm the pastor. I'm the pastor of these churches, you know, and I'm, when I'm sitting there and I hear noise in the back, I can't make myself turn around and look because I just know her head's going to come out of heaven. You know, turn back around, boy, ain't nothing back there that interests you. You know, pay attention, you know, you know, that ain't none of your business, you know, pay attention, man. I'm telling you, she was old school. And when she pointed at you during church, she had a crooked finger. And when she pointed at you, you had to read the curve to figure out who she was pointing at. And if she was pointing at you, it was over with. It was a death sentence. It didn't matter what you did. It didn't matter how good you was. When you got home, you was getting whooping. It just didn't matter how good you was from that point on. Why we didn't learn that, I don't know. Uh, once we got the, the, the crooked finger point, we should just acted like y'all did because it wasn't going to get no worse after that. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you know, well, well, whatever. And so, you know, Mama let me play in the sawdust. I was in shock. There I was at the tent revival. I was on the ground playing in the sawdust. I couldn't believe church don't get no better than this. I mean, we are outside having church, and we're getting to play in the sawdust. How are you going to beat this right here? How are you going to have church better than this right here? Well, I'll tell you how you have church better than that. All of a sudden, I got to listen to what the pastor was saying. And all of a sudden, I realized that he was talking to me. He told us about how Jesus died on the cross and that that thing wasn't something that was way back a long time ago for somebody else, but that was for each one of us and it was for me. And I realized for the very first time in my life that Jesus died because of my sins. And if I put my faith and trust in Him, I could have forgiveness of sins in eternal life. We want to experience that. We want to be very intentional about experiencing that every year at Easter. We want to experience that every single year. It's always my goal to preach at least one sermon, if not two or three, to bring us to that point to say, wow, Jesus died for me. I'll tell you something else that does for me, and I know you're going to shake your head because I know how tough it is. But watching the Passion, I'm telling you, man, I don't like to watch it because it's gut-wrenching and it's, it's like getting kicked in the stomach, you know, and it is tough, it is graphic, it's, boy, it's a lot of stuff. But I, I make myself watch it every year. Because I figure if he lived it, I ought to at least get some type of, you know, real, you know, accurate portrayal of what he went through for me. And so I watch it every year whether I want to or not. And uh, so to me it's important to come to that point to think about what Jesus did for us. So as we consider this all-important question, who killed Jesus? The first question, first answer might be if somebody were... You know, talking about this or debating this, somebody would say, well, maybe the Jews killed Jesus. Maybe the Jews killed Jesus. And as you read the text, you hear the, the Jewish crowd, the Jewish mob saying, let him be crucified. Let him be crucified. You hear them say something worse than that. You hear them say, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter was preaching. He said, men of Judea, and all who dwell in Jerusalem. Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. And now we know the context for verse 38. It was the Jewish people who had a hand at the, at the crucifixion of Jesus. There have been cries of bigotry also 
all through the ages of people who like you know use that as an excuse or a reason to hate Jewish people and anti-Semitic beliefs and, and opinions based upon the fact that the, the crowd was Jewish. That day. that is so ignorant and so stupid to think in those kinds of terms. Of course, prejudice is always stupid. Prejudice is always wrong. They ain't never gonna get right. No matter what, no matter what content, no matter how it looks, it's never gonna be right. Never gonna be right to hate on somebody in a prejudged manner. So, you know, the first question would be, well, or the first bit of evidence might be, well, maybe the Jews killed Jesus. A second debate might lead us to say, well, maybe the religious leaders killed Jesus. Maybe the religious leaders. There was two big events that took place that brought the political side of things to a head. One was the cleansing of the temple. I'm not going to preach on cleansing of the temple before now on Easter, so I won't steal too much of my thunder. But the cleansing of the temple was a big deal. I mean, boy, he went in there, and boy, he got with it, didn't he? I'm telling you, man, that was a situation. And, you know, so many times uh, people are so apt to, you know, think of Jesus in those Sermon on the Mount descriptions, meek and mild man. They forget that Jesus also had some right, righteous indignation. They forget what he's going to do when he comes back at the end of the seven years of tribulation when he puts to death the enemies of, of, of God's people, the Jewish people at that time, and the, the armies of the Antichrist. They forget about all that. And they forget about how he went into the temple and he pulled out a whip. Now, there was one time I was preaching and uh, I decided that it would be cool to pull my belt off. And, uh, my britches are too big for that tonight. So, uh, you know, I, I, don't want any, I don't want any wardrobe malfunctions. Uh, so, yeah, you're welcome. These are the biggest britches I've got. They fit anybody in here. I'm telling you. But anyway, I pulled that belt off, and it was one of the funniest reactions I ever saw in my life. Half of that congregation ducked, and the other half didn't move. And it didn't take long to figure out who knew what about what. Amen. You know, it didn't take you long to figure out who knew what about what a belt was all about, right? And uh, you can imagine Jesus took a whip, and he turned over those money tables, and I mean, man, he just pitched a fit, man. He run them suckers out of there. And you think to yourself, why did he do that? Why was he so angry? He was angry because those people were manipulating the worshipers, the plain, simple people who had come to the house of God to worship. They were manipulating them, taking their money, abusing them. It was an awful thing. Yeah, you know, they were the first, basically, to say, you got to go through us to get to God. And that's always been you know, something that the Lord has not appreciated in any kind of way. And we need to stay away from that. You don't have to go through anybody to get to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You just don't. Okay? At least of all a pastor. Okay? You don't need the pastor. You need the master. Amen. Let's be very, and by the way, that's not very self-serving. You know, I can teach that some other way. But I like to just come on out with it so you'll lower your expectations on what you around you. Okay? I'm telling you right now, you don't need what Steve can do for you. You need what Jesus can do for you. You need the Lord Jesus Christ, and you need as much of Him as you can get. You know, I tell myself, one of these days I'm going to get nothing but t-shirts that say, y'all need Jesus and wear it every time I preach. Because it would always be beneficial and helpful, you know. Uh, that's, that's what we need. And so we find that that was one thing, the cleansing of the temple. Then you had the raising of Lazarus. You say, well, how did that get to be such a big deal? Well, uh, you know, I've explained that to you before. When your competition goes around emptying out the cemeteries and raising the dead, you're going to find it hard to stay in business as a religious entity. If they was raising the dead at some church in Pineville on Sunday and, you know, they, you got two or three videos of it and you had some uh, eyewitness, they doing that? They doing that now? <laughs> yeah, I'd have to shut in, wouldn't you, Dwayne? We'd have to go check on that at least, wouldn't we? 
I'm going to tell you what, man. They go to raising the dead on Monday night somewhere. Y'all going to find somebody else to preach. I'm going to have to go check out this deal. And so he raised Lazarus in his life. Man, you can't let the competition go around raising the dead. And so they were ready to get rid of Jesus. And those two events, the religious leaders were like, man, he's got to go. He's got to go. We can't handle this guy. We can't have him around anymore. He's got to go. So uh, Dr. Gwynn would ask the question. He would say, well, was it the religious leaders? Possibly we could argue for that. Then you could argue, what about the Romans? Did the Romans kill Jesus? Matthew 27, 27. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium, gathered the whole garrison around him. They stripped him, put a scarlet robe on him. And when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then they spat on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Roman law restricted the death penalty to treason. Uh, you know, it couldn't be for a blasphemy. We don't care about your religion. It was because they said he was a threat to Caesar. The title of the placard that was upon his cross, Jesus, King of the Jews. Jesus, King of the Jews. Uh, the discussion that took place between Pilate and Jesus, to me, is absolutely fascinating. Especially when Pilate finally said to Jesus in a confrontational way, he said, don't you know that I have the power to crucify you and I have the power to let you go? Jesus was real intimidated, wasn't he? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Because Jesus said back to him, he said, you wouldn't have any power at all unless it was for my Father in heaven. Amen. You wouldn't have any power at all unless it was for my Father who is in heaven. Well, this was a time when, you know, you could argue the question. And again, Dr. Quinn would very eloquently ask the question. So, after we looked at this, was it the Jews? Was it the religious leaders? Perhaps it was the Romans who killed Jesus. And then his message would take an unusual turn. And he would ask this question. Maybe it was God. Maybe it was God that killed Jesus. Isaiah 53, 4 says this, Surely He, Jesus, has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Isaiah 53, 10, Yet it pleased the Lord, Yahweh, to bruise Him, Jesus. He has put Him, Jesus, to grief. When you made His soul an offering for sin, that's got to be Jesus, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In John 12, verse 27. And this is why I say we need to revisit that uh, Garden of Gethsemane experience. Where Jesus prayed, let this cup pass before me. Because in John 12, 27, just, just a few days before that, he says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. Should I ask God to deliver me from the cross? That's why I came here. I didn't come here to live. I came here to die. I came here to be a, a ransom. I came here to give my life. You know, am I, am I going to beg for my life now? I, mean, I don't think so. I think when he said, let this cup pass before me, I think he was talking about the timing of it. You know, let's, let's, you know, let's let this happen. Let's do it. Let's get this thing done, is what I think Jesus was praying about. So, you know, we could ask the question, uh, did God kill Jesus? Revelation 13, 8, the Bible said he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. In 1 Peter 1, 20, he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world. So it was always God's plan. Even before God created the world, His plan for our redemption was for Jesus to die upon the cross. Did you know that? So in other words, before God said, let there be light, let Him be crucified, was something that He was already had a plan for. So before God even said, let there be light, let's create something, 
Before God even did that, He had a plan for our salvation. He knew about our sin. He knew that we needed redemption. And before He even made us, and before we even needed it, God had a plan for our salvation. There's never going to be another plan. That's why it's ridiculous when a liberal agenda world asks the question, well, show me something else. How else could we get saved? Well, there, you know, <laughs> there's only one way to get saved. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's not the best way. He's the only way. There is no name given among men whereby we must be saved. There's only one way and there's only plan A and there's not going to ever be a plan B. And by the way, when people are asking God to come up with something better, think about the disrespect. Think about how they're trashing the love of God and the sacrifice of what Jesus did for us. Man, that's just crazy. No, there ain't going to be another plan. So we could ask the question or we could bring out the point, well, seeing how it was God's plan and God's all-powerful and all-knowing, Maybe it was God who killed Jesus. And then there's the, the possibility that we could ask this question. Did I kill Jesus? You say, now what you talking about? <laughs> what you talking about, Brother Steve? Isaiah 53, verse 4. Listen. Surely He has borne our griefs and carried <clears throat> our sorrows. Yet we esteemed Him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. He was wounded for whose transgressions? Oh. Ours. He was bruised for whose iniquities? Oh. Our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord has laid on Him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. He died for our sin. Yes, sir. He died because of my sin. And boy, I guess personally. You know, he, he died for the lies you've told. He died for the affair that you had. He died for the times we've lied and cheated and done stupid stuff and had horrible attitudes. Somebody say he came to preach tonight. Yeah. <laughs> He's meddling. He's meddling. I mean, we've all got stuff in our life that we're ashamed of. Every every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. So I just want you to know tonight, He died for our sins. Our sins nailed Jesus to the cross. Colossians 2.14 Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, He has taken it out of the way. Listen. Having nailed it to the cross. Amen. He bore my sins. He nailed my sins to the cross and I bear them no more. It is well. It is well with my soul. Amen. Amen. Jesus died that I might live. So maybe it was me. And then in his eloquent, beautiful way, Dr. William would say, he'd go back through that in a very curious and a, you know, a way that would bring about you know, a lot of you know, anticipation. And he would say, well, was it? Was it the Jews? Was it the religious leaders? Was it the Romans? Was it God? Maybe it was us. Oh, I love the, 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 the story about the passion. That when they got to the part where they nailed Jesus to the cross, Mel Gibson makes a cameo appearance in the passion. It's his Roman soldier hands that nailed Jesus to the cross in that movie. And when they said, why did you do that? He said, I had to experience and to know, hey, my sins nailed Jesus to the cross. He said, I couldn't let nobody else do it. It had to be me. My sins nailed Jesus to the cross. Here's what I want to tell you about who killed Jesus. Jesus was not a victim. He never was. He was a volunteer. Nobody killed Jesus because Jesus gave his life willingly. He did that for you and me. Matthew 26, But Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take the sword will die by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot pray to my Father and He will provide me with more than twelve legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled 
that it must happen thus. You know, Peter cut off the high priest servants here. Remember that? Yep. Yep. It was Malchus was his name that we read about. And you know, I've often, I love that story because in the midst of this, the gigantic cosmic collision, however you want to word it, in the midst of all that, Jesus is worried about a dude's ear. You know, he's, he's fixing to die for the sins of the world. He's being arrested so that he can go to a cross and pay for our sins and all the sins of all humanity for all the ages. And he's on the ground looking for a boy's ear. Yeah, exactly. You know, and you know, he's going to protect his ear. And you know, you, you think, well, who in the world is worried about an ear at a time like that? Can I suggest Malchus Woods? He was very concerned about that ear. You know, and I don't think that boy ever looked in the mirror what he didn't think of the day he lost his ear and got it back. Jesus healed him. What an amazing thing that even in a time like that, Jesus is taking time for individuals and, you know, is concerned about somebody's ear when nobody else on the planet is. He is concerned about what's going on in their life. But don't you love what he said? He said, don't you know, Peter? I mean, put up your sword, son. You know, you, are you going to fight a whole army by yourself? Don't you realize that if I wanted to, I could call 12 legions of angels? Now, who's a mathematician among us? A legion is 6,000. So what's 12 legions of angels? How many angels is that? That's 72. Where did you go to high school? Dry prong. Dry prong got it going on. Be it noted, dry prong. We'll fuck out of night. Yeah. 72,000 angels. 72,000 angels. Now, I can't help but spend just a couple of minutes telling you what one angel can be. You ready? One angel swept over the land of Egypt and killed all the firstborn. I would estimate that number to around 500,000 because there was 2 million Jews and the Egyptians outnumbered the Jews. They were worried about overcoming them in numbers. In one night, 70,000 people, all the way from Beersheba to Dan, were killed by one angel over the judgment over David, uh, counting the people making the census over the people. In one night, 186,000 Assyrian soldiers were killed by one angel. One angel came through the Sennacherib's army. In the book of Revelation, you got all kinds of stuff that one angel's doing. You got seven angels blowing seven trumpets. One of them blows a trumpet and one third of the world's vegetation dies. One angel blows a trumpet and one third of all the water in the ocean is turned to blood. One angel blows a trumpet and one third of all the fresh water is turned to blood. Now I could have named all 21 of those, especially if I read them, but I got bowls of wrath for you. One angel pours out a bowl of wrath and the whole earth, everybody on it is covered with boils except for those who are believers in Jesus. One angel pours out a bowl of wrath and all the ocean is turned to blood. Another angel pours out a bowl of wrath and all the fresh water is turned to blood. One angel pours out a bowl of wrath and all the, the sun is intensified to where men cry out in agony. One angel pours out a bowl of wrath and the lights are turned out on the capital city of the Antichrist. One angel pours out a bowl of wrath and the Euphrates River is dried up. Now, just to help you understand that, the Euphrates River is about as big as the Mississippi River. So the next time you're in Baton Rouge, know that the water under the bridge is about 200 foot deep. Can you imagine if one angel poured out a bowl of wrath and the Mississippi River dried up? That's what one angel can do. One angel poured out a bowl of wrath and there was an earthquake of such epic proportions it flattened all the mountains and got rid of every island. That's what one angel can do. And that's not to even mention the enemy. What is Satan? Who is Lucifer? What kind of crea creation is he? He's an angel. So everything he's ever done is an example of what one angel can do. Think about that. And you say, yeah, but he's the strongest and biggest and the baddest of the angels. Is he? I don't think so. Thank you, y'all. 
I believe that belongs to another guy named Michael, right? Yes, Did Michael already whoop Satan and kick him out of heaven? Guarantee you, long before Michael Jordan, the angels in heaven were singing, I want to be like Michael. Okay? Long before Michael Jordan came along, the angels in heaven were saying, I want to be like Michael. No one angel can take care of business. So you can imagine 72,000 angels at his disposal, ready to be his bodyguards, ready to take care of whatever happens. Did you know that the Superdome will hold 72,638? So there would have been room left over for a few cerebim and cherubim or whatever. All right? So about the size of the Superdome is the body of angels that we're talking about here. Now, if you've ever been to Death Valley, it'll hold 100,000. Can you imagine that many angel bodyguards ready to take care of business? Well, let me help you just a little bit more. What if those one what if one of those angels was John Wayne angel? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, there, Cookie. You better leave my Jesus alone, or I'll blow your head off. <laughs> what if there was a Clint Eastwood angel? This is a 44 magnet. It'll blow your head clean off. Now you've got to ask yourself the question. Do you feel lucky, punk? Well, do you? You've got to have Rip Angel in this thing. I'll take you to the train station, baby. And don't be messing with me. Can you imagine 72,000 angels? Man, you've got to wrap your mind around this and understand once and for all. Jesus was not a victim. They didn't take his life. As a matter of fact, on the cross, it says that he yielded up his spirit, which is aorist active tense, which means once for all, and he wasn't acted upon like death killed him, or the devil killed him, or the enemy killed him, but he yielded up his spirit. He said in John 10, I have the power to lay it down. No man takes it from me. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I'm not going to die till I get good and ready. Amen. I invented life. I created it. I sustained it. And I'll die when I get ready to die and yield up my spirit unto my Father. And then, when I'm in that tomb and I get tired of being dead, I'm just going to come back to life again. Amen. How about them apples? Amen. Take that, death. Amen. Jesus was not a victim. He was a volunteer. And He did it because He loved you. He died that you might have eternal life. He died so that your sins could be forgiven. He died and He did it for you. Now I hope tonight that you've experienced the Gospel moment once again. And we need to do that at least once a year. When we come to that point where, hey, man, this is more than Jesus dying for the world. This is more than Jesus dying for a cause. Jesus was more than an example and He was more than a martyr. It was personal. Jesus died for you. And He died for you. We're going to have a time of invitation. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. As Brenda comes and helps us with this. As you feel the leadership of the Holy Spirit, you want to get saved. You just come on tonight. You want to come to the altar and pray. Whatever God puts on your heart. If you want to come and be a part of our church. We'd love to have you. Let's all stand together. We're going to sing Amazing Grace. I'm going to get all y'all to hit me and lead that. Amazing Grace. If you feel the leadership of the Holy Spirit.